Hello EFD squad and welcome back to Continental Club where we discuss the hottest topics in European football. Joining me is Captain Sambo, fresh from being done by another phishing scam oh. via email. It's Doogie no, Critchley no, no, and no. of course the what's it on the end that is Joe Tomlinson. But what have you been asking us? First question comes from Samuel Masia and he's asked, who do you think will win the Europa League? Now we give it a bit of bad press sometimes on mm -hmm. this show, the full, the full but yeah. round one of fixtures, very, very exciting. Yeah, there's a lot of goals, wasn't there? I just caught the, the highlights of the Rangers game, a good comeback there. But to answer the question, I think the Europa League is always a tournament dominated by the teams that have one outstanding striker. So I can see AC Milan with Higuain doing really well. I can see a Bemiang doing really well in this with Arsenal. They've got Lacazette obviously backing him up as well. Timo Werner with Leipzig. He actually had a surprisingly good Champions League campaign last year in the group stages. Then they dropped into the Europa League and then got knocked out in the next round. Mm. Um, so I could see you know, a combination of any of those teams. I think if Chelsea take it seriously, they could walk it as well. Um, so yeah, those would be my, my three, my, my four main candidates. Um, AC Milan still under a bit of a period of adaption. They only just edged past those complete unknowns as well last night, 1-0, mm. didn't they? Yeah, no, it didn't look too pretty. Um, but if they can get going, I mean, there's a lot of talent in that side. Um, and Emery's obviously got a fantastic record in the Europa League as well. He's got all the Europa League now. And he said he's going to take it really seriously. So, yeah, Arsenal, AC Milan, Chelsea, I can see one of those. Joe, what do you think? Um, I think Chelsea are by far the best side in the competition. If they want to do it, they will win it. But I just don't think Sarri gives a, a flying f about winning You play it. quite a strong team um, outside there. Yeah, and I, I actually completely it as well. I said that Eden Hazard will 100% travel to away yeah. games. Left, left at home, <laughs> left at home to rest yesterday. Uh, on Sunday Sunday vibes. Vibes. Right. I actually said <laughs> it on Sunday vibes yeah. as well, so that Lats. comes out Sunday. So I look even more stupid. Um, but yeah, I think Chelsea have definitely got the best squad, the best manager, and are playing the best football at the moment in, of any team that is in the Europa League. But at the end of the day, the Europa League is going to be won by a team that drops out of the Champions League. Unless Arsenal and Emery produce some miracles, a team that drops out of the Champions League always ends up winning the Europa League. I think it's going to be potentially coming from the Tottenham into Barca group. I think that's a strong group. Mm. Whoever drops out of that, if it is Tottenham Hotspur, obviously not a great result away from home at Inter, but I think it will be between Inter and Tottenham. Whoever drops mm. out of that group becomes probable favourites for me. Could you be a good... Man United, Valencia as well. Yeah, yeah, Valencia probably will drop out of Isn't that it one. Liverpool, I think. PSG, Napoli is the third team in that group, I think. So one of and those. And Red two. Star. And Red Star That's as well. Right. Let's yeah. not rule them out. Horrible yeah. atmosphere. Yeah. Um, yeah, one of those. So I think you. <coughs> ultimately, yeah, one of those will, will be favourites. But from the current crop, Arsenal, Sevilla. As a Manchester United fan, obviously I'm a little bit more invested because Celtic are in this competition yeah. uh, this year. How happy were you when United won it? When did you become invested in the tournament? It's a good question. The only semi final. The only when reason the I was invested in the tournament was because it, it was a route back to the Champions League. Yeah, but at what, at what stage? Surely when it got to the semi final against the Celtic, the stage, Liga, the stage that I was invested you did in the tournament. It regular, yeah. The stage that I was invested in it in the tournament was when we, we when num we numerically win. couldn't finish in the top four anymore. So not it didn't even matter how you're faring in the tournament. No. It was it was your poor league form that rubbish. I mean our route to the it final. It was desperation. It wasn't like we were battering really good teams either. It was like we're scraping. You didn't just think it was another size. another you know another easy way for United to pick up a trophy. Nah, I mean a trophy is a trophy, and it's always nice to lift it, isn't it? And in the final, it was it it was a fairly comfortable win against Ajax, wasn't it? But mm. at no stage was I feeling like, oh my god, we've got like can't wait for the Europa <laughs> yeah. League semi final. I was like, yeah, we're in the Europa League semi-final. Uh, yeah. uh, and the, the main thing that mattered to me was that it, it allowed us to get Champions League football when we finished outside of the top four. Yeah. Out of the British teams in it, I think this tournament's actually quite important for Arsenal because I don't sure. really see them finishing in the top four. Emery's um, already said. Yeah. So for them to pick up a trophy in his first year, if they could, and they've got the squad to potentially go really far in the Europa mm. League, I think. I think it would be the perfect way to kick off his tenure. Um, and Chelsea less so because I think they'll get top four, so it's not quite as important. But again, Sarri will be, I think, will want to get it going. I disagree with you, Joe. I think you know the more game, you know, the more Sarri's games that they can under a system, the more game time you can give to the likes of Loftus Cheek, Hudson Odoi, um, you know, Ampadu. his fringe players, Ampadu, exact, exactly. Oh, There'll be a lot of experience yeah. for these that second tier of Chelsea player. Um, but yeah, the travelling will come into it as well. I mean, they had to go to the Czech Republic last night. Um, mm. 
Oh no, they sorry, they're Panathinaikos. It's Greece. It's Arsenal. They have got some bad travels team, coming yeah. up, Chelsea, in that tournament. It's just a bit of a killer, the Europa League. And I don't think anyone that's challenging for a title really puts emphasis on the Europa League. It's not actually possible. It's, to it's difficult to navigate, isn't it? A lot yeah. of games, uh, a lot of travelling, like you said. I think. So that's why Sevilla are so good at it. Yeah, there was a fair amount of interesting games last night, the first round. For me, the RB Derby. Mm. Caught the eye, so Salzburg Leipzig against Salzburg. Leipzig. Uh, Salzburg beating RB Leipzig actually in Germany, 3-2. A little bit fortunate, watch the extended highlights today. Seemed like a very decent game, I think Salzburg. Four shots on target, three goals in the end. And Clinical. RB Leipzig are a mess in defence, despite having really strong, you know, upcoming prodigious talent like Upamecano, like him at centre-back. He put in seven tackles and three interceptions last night still wasn't enough to keep out three goals. Uh, Nordic Mukieli, I believe, who's a right back but played left back. He's actually a pretty interesting prospect. Creating around one and a half chances a game from left back. He's 22, bought in from Montpellier. He might be one to watch. He looks good going forward. Not great defensively. Now, I thought Salzburg, not Salzburg, sorry, Leipzig, would, would beat them quite comfortably. And for me, we're sort of outside contenders for the Europa League crown. I know their form in the Bundesliga has sort of got exponentially worse yeah. since they've come up. And this season, I think they're 10th. They're conceding an awful lot of shots in games as well. But they're also, I think they've taken the third most shots behind Bayern and some sort of uh, obscure team that I can't remember, maybe like Nuremberg or something. Dusseldorf, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. But there's some talent in that team. Like you said, Timo Werner, Kevin Campbell's come back. He's captain now. Uh, they've got Forsberg, Olsen. Forsberg's back Forsberg. at it, creating three chances uh, per 90 in this campaign. So there's a lot of talent there, a lot of young talent. I just feel like Ralph Ragnick, they're a bit ragged at the moment. Never mind you know, how the effect that Ralph Ragnick's having, because he's sort of galvanised the club every time they've needed him. But it doesn't appear to be the case this time round. So Leipzig, who, who ideally you know, want to get back into the Champions League spots, it's very capable, uh, it's going to be a it's going to be a tough juggling act for them. Yeah. Do they go for the Europa League or do they go back for a Champions League spot? Because probably not good enough to compete on two fronts, like you were saying, because I'm watching the opening game of the Bundesliga when Dortmund completely dispatched them 4-1. Yeah, absolutely turd. But another, if, another team that had quite an iffy start last night was Marseille. They lost 2-1 to Eintracht Frankfurt. And uh, I think they could go quite far in this competition as well. They were obviously finalists last year. They've started Ligue 1 really well. I think they're second, although they're already five points behind PSG. Um, Florian Tovans has scored five and assisted one in four games. Carrying on that form from last uh, season. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Crazy. Dimitri Payet has got three goals to assist. They, they look right at it as well at the start of the season. Um, but yeah, not a good way to start uh, the Europa League campaign. But yeah, Marseille could be in with a shout as well. Shout out to Haidara as well. Scoring last night, I think he's going to be a pretty good player for Salzburg. Mm. I think Arby tried to buy him from Salzburg. This is all very confusing. <laughs> and didn't go through. But Yusef Paulson as well, RB Leipzig, good young talent. Keep your eye on him. Guys, if there's any other clubs you think have a chance at winning the Europa League crown, let us know in the comments below and why. And who do you think is going to win it in the poll? Who did you say? Uh, I'll finish. I've said about everyone. I'll finish with Marseille. Marseille. Um, I'll go Arsenal, but it's going to be whoever drops out of the Champions League. Marseille, Arsenal. I'm going to go. Yeah, I'm going to go RB. I'm going to stick to my guns. No chance. Quick fire questions then before we move on to our big match preview. Something it's we back, started baby. doing last season and then just forgot about. So it's back. By popular demand or unpopular demand. Either it's way, here. works for us. Phil's time. <laughs> Moving on to quick fire questions, like I said. First one comes from Jamie.Wilks134. And he's asked, which new signing do you feel you haven't seen enough of and want to see more of this season? Duke. Um, I haven't caught a lot of Inter Milan, but I'm quite intrigued about why that's not going how we expected it to, because we were all saying before the start of the season that we thought they'd be the closest to Juventus. I think they're already, don't quote me on this, I think they're at least six or seven points behind. That's pretty much the league title done in Syria. Um, long way to go to come back from that. Um, Juventus don't look like they're going to be dropping too many points in Syria this season at all. But one particular signing who I haven't seen a lot of, who was really excited over, just because of all the the controversy over his move this summer is Malcolm. Malcolm's um, awesome. Exactly, yeah. But no, in a different team. Oh, right. I was, <laughs> okay. I was intrigued to see why Inter Milan were doing badly <laughs> and, what, you know, and how Malcolm performs, is what I was going to say. 
because uh, well, after all, they nearly joined Roma, and everyone knows that story with Monchi coming out and saying they basically got completely screwed over last minute. Uh, but yeah, I haven't seen a lot of him in La Liga this year, um, understandably because Usman Dembele has started the season on absolute fire. Um, he looks just like the player we thought he was going to be when he joined, fully fit and absolutely firing. His goal in midweek against PSV was just mesmerising. Um, yeah, he looks the real deal. So yeah, I'm intrigued to see what Malcolm can bring to the table and whether he can give Suarez and Messi rests at crucial points this season, because I think that would be the difference between Barcelona mm -hmm. peaking at the right time in the Champions League, unlike they did last year. Um, with that battering in Rome uh, at the hands of Roma. Um, so yeah, it'll be really int intriguing to see how Valverde, Valverde sorry, uh, uses his attacking resources. Your tongue around that one. Malcolm was great pre-season as well, wasn't he? And I mm. think that now Valverde has reverted to a 4-3-3 three, three from 4-4-2, that he will at times play Dembele on the left, Malcolm on the right, Messi in that number nine yeah. position, and rest Suarez. And Coutinho Suarez coming form, in behind as well. Coutinho yeah. looks really bang at it as well this season. Suarez's well. form has suffered, like you said, as a result of never being Maybe, able yeah. to rest. Joseph? Um, I'll go for Fabinho at Liverpool. Was really excited about this move. I think we talked it up as potentially being the bargain transfer of the summer at around 40 million euros. Um, and I thought he would come in and have a really immediate impact on that Liverpool side. I thought he'd kind yep. of be an upgrade on Jordan Henderson, come and sit in deep midfield and allow Naby Keita to roam a little bit further forward. Obviously, they were chasing Nabil Fakir, uh, Nabil Fakir quite heavily as well. And I thought that kind of move suggested that the midfield would look something like Fabinho, Keita and Adam Lallana. But it just hasn't been the case at all, has it? Uh, James Milner has started the season potentially in some of the best form of his life. And I think he's almost undroppable now for Jurgen Klopp. So because of that, and Jordan, been Jordan, right Henderson, Jordan Henderson uh, has been dropped as well. So it's almost like Fabinho is third in the pecking order in terms of midfielders at the moment. And that is a little bit, it's not worrying, a but it, it's a bit surprising. Um, the Liverpool, rotation at Liverpool is scary, isn't it? It is pretty scary in central midfield in particular. Um, and I think that Fabinho not getting game time will shock a few Liverpool fans, but he hasn't got a right to it at the moment. The Liverpool midfield is playing really well. Wijnaldum yeah. was absolutely outstanding against PSG, one of the best Agreed. players on the entire pitch. So Fabinho's going to have to work really hard to get mm. in that team, given that Naby Keita didn't play against PSG, and he's a shoo-in. Yeah. Now, this might be quite a hard question to address, but do you think... There is a shade of the back Yoko about him in, it, in that he's just not ready for the Premier League yet and he's going to take a little while to embed into an adapter clock system. Maybe we won't see him playing regular minutes until January. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's because of a sort of back Yoko like trait, though. I think that's because they have a deeper midfield right now than Chelsea potentially. Um, and that's saying so. I think Chelsea's front uh, starting three is clearly better in Kovacic. Um, Kante and um, Jorginho, but Liverpool's depth is superb and Fabinho being third, maybe third place on the pecking order at mm. Liverpool in terms of defensive slash central midfielders just shows how far they've come because last season even we were looking at that midfield going it's a little bit thin isn't it yeah. but with the arrival of Cater and Fabinho it's just incredible and the fact that James Milner is able to keep a player like Fabinho out of the side shows how good he's playing at the moment. 100%. I was very surprised because he came back. He had a full pre-season. He didn't go to the World Cup. Um, I was bored during the summer. I was watching his arrival videos at Melwood. And there's about six of them there. Um, and yeah, he was straight in, straight into training and just hasn't had a look in so far. But the good thing for him, I think, is also that he can play at right back. So when they want to give Trent Alexander and Arnold a break... Klein will come in, bro. He's not going um, to get a sniff at right back. Nathaniel Klein I'd coming. rather play Fabinho at right back than Klein. Oh, having been out, for, t having been out for two years, I think Klein would be a risk. Uh, I, yeah, I don't think Klein would be ready to step and in there. And Tite has been playing uh, Fabinho at right back. Yeah. yeah. Which, is that a good or a bad sign for him? Because Fernandinho has not started the season very well. I actually not read an article. Well. And if you can't get in the head of Fernandinho for a game mm. like El Salvador. But then. I think, I, re I read an article and you've got to remember that he's probably fourth, third at least in the pecking order for Brazil as well in terms of defensive midfielders well, with Casemiro, Casemiro, Fabinho in there as well. Yeah, but you're um, hoping against lesser opposition that you get a you chance get a in chance, your preferred yeah. position. In, uh, I read an article actually and uh, I think it was in The Guardian written, I can't remember who it was written by, but it was about Fabinho and how he's viewed in Brazil and he's only viewed as a right, right back. back yeah. Really? Brazil. Nobody in Brazil sees him as a defensive mm. midfielder because when he grew up, he was a right back in Brazil, and he hasn't successfully yeah. made that transition. Oh. So I thought he was the DM that, that could play right back. Right. He's not a very sort of narrow-minded guy. This is a 
manager who travelled, you know, quit after he won the Copa Libertadores to travel to Arsenal, to travel to Real Madrid, to learn European ways. So mm. I'm not sure he's going to be wedded to the idea of Fabinho playing right back just because he played right back in the Brazilian league. But I do, I don't know, I, I do feel like he, Jurgen Klopp thinks he's just not ready. Mm. Yeah, and I just kind of feel like Jurgen Klopp's found a really nice formula in midfield and doesn't need to change it, so why change it? Yeah. They're, oh, they're, they're starting the, the season fantastically, five wins from five. Why drop a midfielder now when you've just rested one in the Champions League in Naby Keita? Why drop it for the, for the Premier League? You I don't do think that was an interesting that decision, resting Naby Keita. If, if, if I was Jürgen Klopp, I'd be keeping the same eleven for as many games as I possibly could. Get a run of season. steam out. Yeah. It always feels like teams that win the Premier League are the teams that have the most consistent starting eleven. Yes, yeah. I think that was the case with Chelsea, wasn't it? But that's, Chelsea, but that's because they didn't. Chelsea. But they didn't. They, neither of those teams had uh, Champions League football. Yeah. I Whereas Man City last year changed quite a fair bit. I was going to say I'd like to see the number. Yeah. So I mean, I, I think Guardiola made the most changes to his side out of anyone in the Premier League. Um, but it, obviously, he was competing in four fronts, still yeah. quite deep. So. And I feel like Liverpool's midfield three can afford to be a little bit more industrious when they've got so much creativity. Well, or service, let's mm. say, through their fullbacks. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Alexander Arnold. I made my thoughts. I've made my thoughts very clear on him recently. I think he's going to be the best right back in the world in a couple of years. And that Robertson just gets better and better. Robertson's well, playing. He? He's now entered the discussion for. Ceiling, he's now entered the discussion for top ten left backs in the world in a, in eighteen months. It's remarkable. I think there's a bit of a, a dearth of top top fullbacks at the minute. Yeah. In comparison to yeah, it's maybe true, the early two thousands, and as a result, I would probably. Be inclined to agree with you there, mate. Good quick fire question, that lads. We took yeah, around sorry. ten minutes to answer yeah, that. Sorry. Anyway, moving on to Agada underscore eighteen's tweet. He's asked, "What player would improve your favourite team squad overall?" Doesn't have to be a big name. So um, that's what that's what he said. Will be a big name though. Sergio Ramos, central defence for Manchester United. Christ, any defender at United, really? Yeah, pretty much any central defender. And he would be your pick from world football. Yeah, Sergio Ramos. Said so him. not Van Dijk, not Varane, you'd go with Ramos. Why Ramos? Um, just because I think he's the best centre-back in the world. So if I can have anyone, and our worst area is quite clearly central back, central defence, I would take the best centre-back in the world. Okay, Fair. I mean, yeah. Fair I mean, no one really wants to hear who can improve Sunderland because the list is pretty endless. But uh, probably go for a, like a, a championship level keeper. We could probably use down a league one. Our keeper's made a few errors in recent games. If we could tempt Jack Butland next year when we get promoted to join us, that'd be potentially quite exciting. We're in League One. We're in League One. How are you going to tempt Jack Butland when we get promoted to the Championship? Stoke against are doing crap Jack in the Championship. Butland, the guys on the peripheries of the England squad. Yeah, Jack Hard Butland one. or Joe Allen's on. You know, he he could fancy. Right, let's move off controlling Sunday the quickly. midfield. Get off what it. a fall from grace that'd be for Jack Butland. <laughs> Although I don't think he is quite as good as people make. Definitely out. not. No, to be definitely honest. not. Um, Celtic. One point five saves per goal he concedes. Celtic, oh God, any mildly more interesting than Sunderland. We definitely need a centre-half. We've taken Benkovic on loan, That's who a was probably man of the match on his debut against Rosenborg last night. So if we could keep him and he continues, you know, in this vein of form, then great. But, you know, Leicester will take him back and we'll probably, you know, sign someone from Manchester City's Youth Academy. Uh, other than that, we probably need an attacking midfielder to replace Stuart Armstrong, who went to Southampton. I've actually not seen much of him at Southampton. Not many Just someone who can get beyond the forwards. Uh, other than that, I think this is the most settled squad we've had in a while. And we played some pretty good football against Rosenborg last night. Sure. Moving Ramos, on. Ramos, Benkovic. <laughs> wow. Ramos, probably should have finished on Joe there. <laughs> Anyhow, right, next question and final one. Can you see Dembele or Mbappe becoming the new Messi or CR7 rivals, oh Christ, I wish I hadn't started this, of the Ballon d'Or after the retirements of Messi and CR7. That comes from regular contributor Tony Kazunga. Not your finest work, Tony. Kazunga, you're on a two-week ban. <laughs> no questions I, I, for Kazunga I two weeks Absolute after that. shambles. Sure, sure Take your time out. Right click, two week fine, no reason. <laughs> yeah, right. um, so, do you think that Dembele and Mbappe will reach those sort of levels? Um, uh, go on, you take it. Uh, who's, who's more likely to then? Because it's very. I think at the moment Mbappe is ahead, yeah. um, just because he's had that whole year last year at PSG, smashing it, played a key part in the World Cup, whereas Dembele was a bit part player, um, but. Mbappe will probably move to Real Madrid eventually. It will be the new rivalry, but they'll be. I think they're pretty good mates off the pitch. I don't see them hitting the goal numbers of Messi and Ronaldo, um, but yeah, they'll be the two outstanding players of the next ten years, along with Neymar. 
Um, so yeah, potentially. That is actually well exciting. Mbappe at Real Madrid and Usman Dembele at Tearing Barca. it up. That's so good. Yeah. I would love to see Mbappe that. Is up is going to score more goals than Dembele because Dembele is more of a creator. I think. Well, uh, think, uh, how good, uh, think how good this French team is going to be in five years. When it comes it's down to Ballon d'Or rivalries, team. it always like it always seems to come down to goal numbers and also like Trophy sort ball. of like size of the name. Do you mm. know what I mean? Like an Mbappe for me right now is is still a level ahead of Dembele in terms of if you went to the average man on the street and went, oh, who's better, Mbappe or Usman Dembele? Quite a few people would be like, definitely Mbappe. I don't even think Usman Dembele is anywhere near it. Do you know what I mean? Whereas a lot of like actual cultured football heads might be like it's closer than people think. I totally agree. I had, mate, I had an argument with a mate the other day because I said Dembele is not that far off Eden Hazard. And he was like, what? Who does even Dembele play for? Like, yeah, fuck. exactly. That's, what, that's not where doing it is. This. And that's pretty much where the FIFA committee lie on, yeah. <laughs> on Ballon d'Or. Well, well now it's FIFA the best and Ballon d'Or separate from that. So we might see some more outside shouts contend for the Ballon d'Or. I want to I see the days of, you know, Kaka. David yeah. De Gea. Get him nominated. Yeah, yeah. The Lionel Messi of goalkeepers. He deserves to be in the top three. Also, best they could reward things. like defenders or yeah, all keepers once in a while. I mean, Varane could be in with a shouting a couple of years as well. Um, I mean, Varane's trophy cabinet is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, isn't it? yeah, that's jokes. Yeah, he, he he will be in in with a shout. Probably a bit strong, but. He could Maybe. be, you know. Outside shout. Outside anyway, there. let's move on to our big match previews. And you wrote these, Dougie, so I'm going to be pretty reliant on you to take yeah. us through them. Yeah, yeah. So it's Real Madrid versus Espanyol. Now, just to give you a bit of what context. What a game. <laughs> what do you mean? It's a big match preview. Come on, Joe, get excited. And Real Madrid, oh. Espanyol. <laughs> Espanyol, Buzz. you know, they're the second biggest team in Barcelona. <laughs> it's almost El Clasico. <laughs> Right, so to give you a bit of context, both sides have started the season very, very well. Real Madrid, three wins, one draw. They sit second, two points behind Barca and Espanyol. Also have two wins, one draw, one loss. Sit fourth. Real, scoring a lot, not conceding a lot. A little bit more fluid in that front three under Lopetegui. Have you watched much of them? Doug, are you impressed by them? I Please take us through the rest have of this. watched uh, quite a few extended highlights, haven't caught them live yet, and I am really impressed by them. I think they look more cohesive. Uh, they've slightly switched from a more counter-attacking style into a more possession base. I've actually got the statistics here if you want. So last year they're averaging 57.8% possession with an 88.3% pass accuracy. This year, that's gone up to 66.2% possession. Oh, it's like Van Straten's here in spirit. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Just give us a, an expected a bit of, goals number. Add a bit of girth and give me a bit of beard. Ooh! Uh, and yeah, then, uh, girth. <laughs> girth. What, nice. Love Lovely big Pat's man. Lovely Pat's big man. Wow. And, Somebody uh, get that out and send it to Pat quickly. Uh, they've, they've gone up to 66.2% possession with a 90.6% pass accuracy. Admittedly, they haven't had the toughest of runs. They played Getafe, Corona, Leganes, and Athletic Bilbao, who they drew against last weekend. Uh, Gareth Bale looks absolutely scintillating. Uh, he's ha he's scored, uh, sorry, he's scored three goals and got two assists. And Benzema looks rejuvenated. And lots of people thought that the departure of Cristiano Ronaldo would really negatively affect Benzema's game because they did link up really well. But Benzema looks, you know, just a lot freer. It looks like he's lost a lot of weight. Uh, I don't mean that. It's like I'm it, no, being a fattest right now. He, why is he, he being a fattest? He man? genuinely looks no, like he's lost a lot of weight. He looks trimmer. He actually wow. has. He's, he's Return to pre-season uh, about five kilograms lighter than there we it has go. in any other year. Wasn't just and me being fattest. Uh, some of the fitness coaches at Real Madrid uh, have said this is the lightest he's returned uh, to a Real Madrid pre-season. And as a result, yeah, hasn't started the season like a fucking slug. Yeah. And they played really well against Roma in midweek as well. Um, they took them apart. Completely. Mariano Diaz's goal in that game was absolutely nice, awesome. It? And it still wouldn't have been as good as if Asensio had scored that turn, no look finish. I'm not sure if about this turn, no look. If he had scored that goal, it would have been magic. If it? I'm Lepetti, uh, I would be furious with him. Furious. Lepetti-Falou. So Lepetti-Falou, um, Le yeah, all of that. Quick note it's on Gareth Bell. so though. annoying. I think he has completely disproved me. In terms of, I remember saying on a Sunday oh, vibes, we're delighted about that, that he, um, <laughs> he would not be anywhere near the shot monster that Cristiano Ronaldo is. And I think he's taking four shots a game yeah. at the moment in, in the league. Yeah, he and took, Cristiano he, he was took six five, against Roma. Roma. Yeah, so crazy. sort of Ronaldo numbers. Against uh, Roma, he actually could have scored a hat-trick. There was a couple of great chances that he actually did really well to create himself. I remember one was a touch over the top and he hit it first time uh, on, the, on the volley. On the volley. Just to the right side. He hit the crossbar as well, didn't he? Obviously scored His a, goal was really nice as well. Scored a lovely goal, great finish, low across the goalkeeper. And 
If he stays fit, the, he's going to score yeah, well, so many goals. Well, that's what I was going to say. Lopetegui bought him off for Mariano, and I think we might see that quite a lot through yeah. the season. Mariano's almost there as to facilitate maintaining Gareth Bale's fitness. Like, yeah. Let's put someone capable on for the yeah. last 20 minutes so Gareth doesn't pull his fucking out. And it's really nice seeing more of Asensio as well. He started really well. Isco looks right at it. I just think they look, they look really good at the moment. And Lopetegui, I'm not getting his name right today. <laughs> It's doing quite an interesting thing in midfield where uh, against the teams they're expected to beat, he's actually just dropping Casemiro entirely and playing Cruz as a holding midfield. Yeah, and shock. Danny Caballos you don't need Casemiro. Six tackles and interceptions against Ibar. No. No surprise there. Let's get a prediction for this game then. 2-0. Um, they're, uh, yeah, they're, they're at home. Uh, Espanyol actually started the season quite well. Surprisingly, because they lost Gerard Moreno. You don't get but to call. Who, let's do a prediction. You're presenting Sunday. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> I um, what, are you trying to say that you're bored of the Real Madrid Espanol? Yeah, pretty Big much. Pretty <laughs> much. Um, you scripted this. Give him a slap. Uh, oh. <laughs> don't. <laughs> <laughs> what is this turning into? Um, <laughs> no, Friday, Friday midday. George has got about three hours to edit this before it goes out. And we got to go Nando. No, so. you're right. You're right. We are going. Now. Yeah. Let's get predictions. Like Joe said, what are we doing? Yeah, two 0 Real Madrid. Uh, five 0 Madrid. Fucking hell. Five nil. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a pumping. Uh, three one. Leon versus Marseille. Let's make this short and sweet. Then uh, this is a clash between last season's third and fourth place, who only finished a point <coughs> apart. And of course, third place in France gets you Champions League qualification straight into the group stages. But fourth place is the Europa League. So maybe a bit of blad, blad blood, bad blood as mm. a result of that. But it is like you said, Marseille have started far better this season. Bottom from the. European competition. Yeah, no, 100%. Leon, um, Leon have actually looked a bit shaky. Uh, they drew uh, two all in their last game against Cannes, who finished 16th uh, last season. Uh, they lost Mariano in the summer and they brought in your man, Moussa Dembele. But he's only made one start. Um, is that, yeah, a little stab in the back there uh, for Christopher. But yeah, they, they are taking about 20 points, I think it's 20.6 shots uh, per game, which is the highest in the league. But they're just, their finishing has been atrocious so far. So they may need big Dembele to start firing. They're, they're still got Bertrand Chilroy. They're taking more shots than Juventus are in Serie A. Yeah, it's game. mental. With it's mental. Denver. And uh, PSG actually seventh on that uh, statistic that I saw this morning. So, yeah, uh, Lyon not started that well. Marseille doing much better in the league. Florent Tovan, as I mentioned before, on fire. Uh, I think this actually could be quite even. I'm going to go with a score draw, one all. Yeah, I think Lyon, as... M mixed as their start's been, they won the first three games, didn't they? And I think they lost and drew. Mm. I think their their form will pick up as soon as they start hitting the net. I think they're probably the second best team in France behind PSG. I, I was so Monaco impressed. Not it. Yeah. I was so impressed by them against Manchester City. What in particular did you? I think Nabil Fakir. Notice. I don't know whether Nabil Fakir is somebody's like breathed a bit of fresh air into him after <laughs> the move to Liverpool collapsed. But he looks he looks so good this year. He's gliding past players. As sloppy as, as, sloppy as Man City were, particularly Fernandinho in that game, his finish for the, I think it was Leon's second, was unbelievable. And they were unlucky not to get a third as well. Of course, Memphis Depay hitting the post. Great ball in for the first Unbelievable as well. save as well off the Memphis Depay effort. Um, I think once Moussa Dembele finds his form, which he will, you're a massive fan of Moussa Dembele, aren't you? And I think once he actually starts scoring, yeah. he took three shots in his first game, I think. And I think they're actually having over seven expected shots on target this season. It's quite a slow start and he's been quite Does, injury Is it still a bit prone. slow? Yeah. yeah. Leon is still getting over seven <laughs> shots on target a game. As Don't well. need him. We've got Lee Griffiths and his new f***ing hairline. It's oh back, God. maybe, it from the depths. reappearing. The Lee, talk to me. You know, so we can sort something out. <laughs> Sponsorship. Also, I've never seen anyone do the phone hand like this. His phone hand was this. Was no one's ever done the phone hand like that. Griezmann and Lee Griffiths, come at me. The ball right. ones. <laughs> anyway, score predictions. Uh, two I said all. one all. One all. Two all, one all. It's going to be tight. Who's at home? Leon. I think Leon are going to win this. Two one. Nice. Get your score predictions in the comments below. That is it for this week's Continental Club. Got steadily worse. That was a mess. <laughs> but today. we got through it. We're going, Nando's. George probably isn't now. He's got to finish this by five o'clock. <laughs> looks devastated behind the camera, but just to get you, get you to go, mate. Anyway, what else is happening? <laughs> um, go check out Football Daily, where VFN uh, with Joe Look and this, Zach would have just gone. Well, have, you, have you brought that down? It's classy. You get? Glassy. I'll go through about four or five of them a day. I expect to see like You're a pint of milk in there. I know, I'm That's like a camel. <laughs> and uh, yeah, go check out VFN. Come back on Saturday for the Football Social.
with this guy in the chair once again. No, I'm not there. Oh, you're not there. It's no. not. Are you there? Smithy returns. I'm definitely not. Under the age of 25. Right, none of us so. are there. Feet up. I'm at Dave Jackson's wedding. Ah. Wee. There we go. Bye. Bye. <laughs>